Hello again from a, a very hot Hong Kong. Now today, I'm going to look at doubt in a Christian context, and I'll distinguish what I consider valid from invalid doubts. I also want to make the point, even before I begin, that having doubts does not mean you are not a true Christian. This is actually an enemy lie that needs to be rejected. The type of dilemma Christians can have is conveyed in this very real question. How do I overcome my doubt and fear that I do not trust Jesus? And this question went on to ask, is it medically possible to drive nails through hands and both feet without breaking a bone? Or do we just trust that God somehow made this happen in the case of Jesus? How do I banish doubt and, tr and trust Jesus? I feel like my mind is tortured by doubt and I feel so scared that I will never trust Jesus with saving faith. I truly believe that he is the way, the truth and the life, but sometimes wave of panic wash over me and I feel like God is not even real or that I can't love Jesus like I'm commanded to. As it happened, this person was unknowingly addressing this question to a Christian doctor who was able to confirm that it's perfectly possible to drive nails through hands and feet without breaking a bone. But more importantly, someone who was able to confirm that having doubts does not mean that one is not a true Christian. The Merriman-Webster definition of doubt includes to have no confidence in someone or something. Now I've selected this particular definition for a reason, and that is to expose the source of doubt that influences both Christian and non-Christian alike, namely Satan. This leads me to discuss the doubts that must be dismissed when they arise because they are designed in the case of, non of the non-Christian, to doubt the existence of God, and for the Christian, to suggest that God is not trustworthy. The non-Christian is left with no confidence in the existence of God, and the Christian with no confidence in his character. I urge non-Christians who are watching this message to examine the evidence for God's existence. And at the end of this message, you will be referred to archived messages which deal with just this issue. The Christian, especially those who are relatively new to the faith, need not accept, as the devil will surely whisper, whisper to them, that because they have doubts, they are not true Christians after all, and should give up and return to a non-Christian lifestyle. We have to understand that Satan was working his lies from the very outset of man's existence and achieved a measure of success with the fall of Adam and Eve. The result of the fall for the Christ follower is that he or she lives with inattention between a natural inclination to the things of this world which pull towards Satan and a spiritual inclination for the things of God. However, when someone truly gives their life to Christ, a process called sanctification takes place, which is another way of saying that the person progressively becomes more like Christ, and this affects the Christ followers' thoughts, actions, and life choices. So when it comes to choices, the things of the Spirit and God increasingly win out against the things of the world and Satan for the Christ follower. But the things of Satan or the pull of the world do not totally disappear. Doubt of the type we are discussing here is an emotion deriving from the things of Satan and will be ever present whilst we live in this world. However, the process of sanctification will ensure that doubt in the Lord and his character will progressively become less and less significant, ideally to the point of insignificance. 
The power of Satan to shake the confidence of man in God cannot be underestimated. Aside from the fall of Adam and Eve, we have many examples of Satan sowing seeds of doubt, even when God's presence was evidence to all. In the book of Exodus 13, verses 21 to 22, we learn that by day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. However, during this same time, we also have in Exodus 16, verses 2 to 3, the following. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It's incredible to think that even with the visible presence of God to guide them, the Israelites still did not have total confidence in the Lord's motives. A particularly surprising expression of doubt took place during Jesus' time on this earth and involved of all people, John the Baptist. Jesus' description of John the Baptist is recorded in Luke 7, verse 28. This is what he says. I tell you, amongst those born of women, none is greater than John. Nevertheless, whilst languishing in prison, awaiting his fate at the hands of King Herod, we learn the following in Matthew 11, verse 2 to 3. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? This is the very same John who had baptized Jesus and stated in John 1, verse 29 to 32, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I say, after me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. My point here is that Satan is very accomplished at sowing seeds of doubt. If he could do it when the presence of God was visible for all to see, as was the case with the Israelites on their way to the promised land, he certainly can sow seeds of doubt in us. If he could sow seeds of doubt in John the Baptist, a man who was spiritually connected with Jesus, recalling from Luke 1, verse 40 to 41, that he leapt in his mother's womb when she met the pregnant Mary. A man who had previously recognized Jesus for who he was and witnessed the Spirit descending on Jesus. How can we hope to be totally free from Satan-planted doubt? Note also that John would be spending much of his time isolated in prison, during which time the seeds of doubt were sown. Now there's a principle here that we need to understand, namely that Satan is at his most powerful when we are alone. Christians who are mature in Christ will recognize the need to be doubly diligent against the devil's deception when they are isolated from fellow Christians. If ever you find yourself in isolation, recognize your vulnerability. Know that the attack on your mind will probably come and be prepared to reject doubts and fears in the name of Jesus Christ. Be ready to, with appropriate scripture, 
and have praise and worship music playing because these are effective spiritual tools against Satan's attack, especially when you're alone. Without wishing to be alarmist, and I am addressing this to non-Christians and Christians alike, suicides generally take place when people are isolated and alone. In actual fact, we will never be totally free of doubt until we enter the gates of heaven. But this does not make any one of us lesser Christians. It just confirms that we are human. What is important is to be able to deal effectively with doubt. And what I've just suggested are ways of dealing with the doubts that are manifestations of Satan's evil deceptions. So far we've been looking at doubts that are the result of the fall and the subsequent work of the devil to deceive us into believing either that God does not exist or that he is not to be trusted. However, we need to be aware that some doubts are valid and should result in our investigation to confirm or allay them. The first type of doubt concerns what the Bible calls false prophets. Here is a relevant passage from Matthew 7, verses 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Now I recognize that all scripture is God breathed according to 2 Timothy 3 verse 16. But it is wise to pay particular attention to the words of Jesus himself. And that's exactly what is contained in Matthew 7 verses 15 to 20. In the Christian community, there are ways to test whether, whether one is dealing with false prophets. It's important to note that such a person does not need to be a church leader, but could be someone who enters your church or fellowship and appears to have an aura of holiness about him or her, and maybe someone gifted with eloquent speech. In other words, the term false prophet needs to be interpreted widely. Note also that doubts as to the Christian authenticity of such persons is important because one might be dealing with a ravenous wolf who, if not checked, will decimate the flock. Jesus gives us the method of confirming or allaying our doubts in such circumstances, namely, the fruit. Quite simply, talk is cheap. The false prophet will talk one way and walk another. The true test is the extent to which he or she walks the talk. As if to confirm how important this is in a Christian context, the expression in common usage is practicing what we preach. Aside from the walking the talk test, when someone is in a church pastor position, a further test is whether what he or she is preaching is a totally Bible-based message. No matter how eloquent he or she may be, anyone, anyone whose preaching is not grounded in Scripture should be avoided. Departure from Scripture is equivalent to the yeast that Jesus refers to in Matthew 16, verse 6. This is what he says. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Sensible Christ followers should follow the example of the Bereans described in Acts 17 verse 11, who applied their rule even to the teachings of Paul. 
Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Christ followers should also be diligent students of the Bible. This is our manual for life, and if we do not study it diligently, how are we to live? Let's expand the God-breathed reference made earlier, which was 2 Timothy 3.16. The expanded version says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I fail to see how a Christian can walk through life without regularly and diligently studying the Bible. However, there is another important reason for becoming something of a Bible scholar, and that is to check out allegations, for example, that the Bible is full of contradictions or that the Old Testament is harsh and cruel and depicts a vengeful God very different from the God of the New Testament. If these allegations are not checked out, then they can sow seeds of doubt that can be worked on by the enemy to draw you away from the faith and the blessings that would otherwise await you. Time does not permit me to tackle either of these issues here, but I'll be doing so in later messages. However, I do want to recommend that you take the time and trouble to check out these allegations for yourself in order to allay any doubts you may be harboring regarding the accuracy of the Bible and the character of God. There is much Christian literature available these days in Christian bookstores and online, and the internet itself has a wealth of resources to help you arrive at an informed opinion. I can guarantee that if you do the work, you will find that all these allegations are without foundation and have no substance. Now let me summarize. Having doubts in no way should be interpreted to mean that the doubter is a poor Christian or not a Christian at all and therefore should give up and return to a secular lifestyle. Similarly, those leading a secular lifestyle and looking for more meaning out of life should not let doubt as to God's existence deflect them from fully investigating the faith. Doubt as to the existence and nature of God is an ever-present part of the human condition because it is the work of the enemy, who is the deceiver of the whole world, as we are told in Revelation 12 verse 9. Nevertheless, those who give their lives to Christ and choose to walk in obedience will progressively begin to understand the evil ways of Satan and become less and less subject to the doubt that he tries to sow in their minds. Your enemy, the one who wants to be successful in stopping you receiving your inheritance, has power when Christ followers and non-Christians are in isolation. And for the former, it's important to know how to deal with him during these times, as already mentioned. For the non-Christian, the remedy is to give one's life to the Lord and so obtain the coverage of Christ and the coverage of fellow Christ followers. Doubt is legitimate when it involves discerning whether or not someone falls into the category of a false prophet. And the two tests are the fruit of the person and in the case of a Christian leader or pastor, the extent to which they are preaching the Bible-based word. Another area of legitimate investigation is when doubt is harboured concerning the accuracy of the word of God and his loving nature based on criticisms that opponents of the faith level at the Bible. For all, I recommend that the resources we now have, including much Christian literature and the internet, be used to allay any doubts. 
The investment of time spent doing this will be the best investment you will ever make in your life. Why? Because it has eternal consequences. Now, as usual, we in TLC World are ready to give you all the support you feel you need to deal with any doubts you may have, whether you are currently a Christ follower or not. Just email admin at the littlechurchworld.org and we will do the rest. So that's it for this week. Uh, next week I'll join you again when I'll be dis discussing the issue of fear, which is very often associated with doubt. Until then, have a blessed week and I'll see you next week. Goodbye.